Popular culture actively shapes our collective understanding of the Second World War. Books, films, television shows, war games, scale models, militaria, restored vehicles, vintage firearms, and living history events all create meaning through unique areas of research, from grand strategy, to vehicle markings, to underwear patterns. Content providers eager to provide authenticity for increasingly sophisticated consumers have sometimes allowed anachronisms to creep in along the way. This video will address two of them. Throughout history, new military technologies have often outpaced tactics. From the mid-1800s, infantry massed together for command and control purposes became increasingly exposed to accurate and concentrated firepower from new weapons such as muskets with rifled barrels and machine guns. By World War II, tactics had evolved to defeat these technologies. Tactical command was decentralized and soldiers dispersed into small groups. Infantrymen in World War II, primarily armed with bolt-action rifles, were not trained to shoot on the move. When fired on, soldiers found cover and returned aim fire. This was accomplished by securing the rifle stock in the shoulder and bringing the sights level with the eyes. It was not practical to move from place to place with the rifle in this position, and thus soldiers had to find a balance between mobility and bringing the weapon to bear quickly. The introduction of semi-automatic rifles brought about changes in tactics, including the ability to return fire immediately upon taking enemy fire. Today's infantry armed with assault rifles maximize their increased firepower by using ready positions, in which the weapon can be quickly transitioned from movement to aimed fire. In the low ready position, the butt of the rifle is in the shoulder, both hands are in a firing position, and the muzzle of the rifle is pointed down. In a high ready position, the weapon is still under the arm and both hands grasp the weapon under control, but the muzzle is pointed up. Images of ready carry are so common today that when filmmakers depict Second World War soldiers doing the same thing, mainstream audiences might not even notice. For discerning audiences, though, it can be jarring. Modern weapons carries aren't just occurring in films. This otherwise excellent painting by Ken Smith shows a World War II GI in the low ready position, and since the artwork has been used for a box top illustration, the anachronism is spread to war games as well. One of the best discussions of how soldiers in World War II actually carried their weapons is on the webpage of the 90th Infantry Division Preservation Group. The excellent work of Charles McFarlane and Mike Ellis is highly recommended and a link to the article is provided in the video description. British and German sources also reinforce the conclusions of the 90th Preservation Group. Soldiers in World War II required extensive training, including two to four months of common or basic training, followed by additional instruction in a specific trade – infantry, armor, artillery, etc. It was here that soldiers learned to handle weapons, first by doing a ceremonial-style drill and later by using them in the field. The position of port arms is an intermediate position. In the U.S. Army, port arms was drilled into individual soldiers. The 90th Division site notes that this position became muscle memory and is often seen in photos taken away from the drill ground as it was both familiar and a natural position for carrying the weapon. The German and Commonwealth armies did not have this movement in their drill manuals, but all three militaries had commands for sling arms and order arms, and these also would have become muscle memory activities that would have carried over into how weapons were actually carried in the field. Sling arms is the hanging of the weapon on the body with a leather carrying strap or sling. For drill purposes, the rifle was carried over a specific shoulder with the other arm free. In the field, the weapon might be slung on either shoulder or across the back. Order arms is a resting position used in parade ground drill, but it's possible that this too created muscle memory that affected how soldiers stood with their weapons in casual or informal settings. The one hand balance was used in a number of situations with the rifle carried in one hand at the point of balance. This is commonly seen in photos of all nationalities, and worth noting, the Commonwealth armies actually taught it as a drill command called Trail Arms for use on long marches. In infantry units with rifle regiment traditions, it was even used to march past the inspecting officer on ceremonial parades. The Germans actually made great use of the trail position in combat situations and had a specific drill movement, Hinlegen, or Lay Down, that taught the soldier how to take cover when carrying the weapon in one hand. The website at derersteszug.com makes a number of good points about the trail carry. All Germans were taught to be right-handed, and so photos show the weapon invariably carried in the right hand. The Hinlegen drill further reinforced the notion of the dominant hand. Carrying the rifle at the trail is comfortable, and allows the soldier to swing the opposite arm. Many assault rifles after the war were in fact manufactured with carrying handles at the point of balance. Most importantly, as noted earlier, the bolt-action rifles weren't expected to be needed instantly. 
The German squad depended on the firepower of the light machine gun, with the riflemen supporting it, and there was actually no perceived need to carry the weapon at the ready. A number of carrying positions either evolved naturally in combat or were taught. All carrying techniques are a trade-off between mobility and ease of bringing the weapon to bear. The closest method of carriage to the modern ready carry is identified by the 90th Division page as the underarm hang, where the weapon is carried in both hands, generally at hip level, with the muzzle at about 45 degrees from the horizontal. The weapon could be brought to bear quickly, but since this carry is more fatiguing than others, it would have been used only when contact was imminent. The 90th Division website suggests GIs probably used the port arms out of muscle memory developed in training, and photographic evidence shows a low version, with the weapon held in both hands and the rifle closer to horizontal, which was used by all the major combatants. The low port arms position facilitated snap shooting. Wartime articles such as this one from the American Infantry Journal talk about snap shooting, or shooting from the hip. It was considered the best way to quickly bring a weapon to bear at close range and fire instinctively. The illustration makes clear that the weapon was not carried with the butt in the shoulder as modern soldiers do. Der Erste Zug notes that the Germans also trained to do snap shooting, or Hufschuss, point blank shot from the hip. This was only done at extreme close quarters as the bolt action rifle was considered useless when fired without aiming, and the Hufschuss put the rifle in position to follow up with a bayonet thrust. The 47th London Division of the British Army developed a rigorous set of tactical drills they called Battle Drill. The system was developed in the UK in 1942 and spread to the Canadian Army by the Calgary Highlanders who were stationed nearby. A look at the so-called Battle Drill Bible shows references to weapons carriage in combat conditions. A two-handed carry was prescribed and photos suggest the most common method was a low-style port arms with the ability to snap shoot. The parade ground stance of order arms was not done with loaded weapons. In the field, where weapons were of necessity loaded, soldiers often cradled them under the arm for informal carriage, letting the body and equipment bear some of the weight and keeping the muzzle under tighter control. The Germans found this position also permitted for quick transition to the Hufschuss or snap shot. Smaller weapons like the M1 carbine, Thompson submachine gun, MP40 machine pistol, or Sten machine carbine could be comfortably carried in one hand, leaving the other hand free. While many other carries were used, these are the most common types referenced on the 90th Division page. Soldiers in combat generally used methods that worked regardless of what they were taught. The 90th Division page suggests the Americans discouraged use of the low port, for example, in training, since holding the weapon horizontally was forbidden in order to maximize safety. GIs in combat did it anyway, because it was comfortable and effective, all of which is another reason not to believe the modern ready carries would have been widely used. Modern weapons with pistol grips and patrol slings are made for such a carry, the longer, heavier bolt-action rifles of World War II were not, nor did their training or tactics require them to be carried in such a manner. They were just kids from New Brunswick. It is unfortunate that the use of modern carriage has crept into otherwise high-quality offerings. This Canadian Heritage Minute is an emotionally charged, historically accurate presentation, marred only by the anachronistic weapons carriage that an enthusiastic director or military advisor incorrectly suggested. Related in part to the carriage of weapons, one other anachronism in depictions of World War II has crept into living history events. Photos taken during the Vietnam War, Gulf War of 1991, Gulf War of 2004, or Afghanistan show prisoners of war put to the ground on capture. Hands are often bound and blindfolds applied while guards hold weapons at the ready. World War II reenactors have applied these modern practices to their own public displays. And why not? It's common sense that prisoners be tightly controlled. The reality in World War II, however, is that images almost always show prisoners being secured and searched standing up. Captors are generally not seen in overly threatening poses. The Hawthorne effect, a phenomenon where individuals modify their behavior in response to being observed or photographed, may play a part in how prisoners are treated in contemporary photographs. But for the most part, reenactors seem to use far more aggressive and modern prisoner handling skills than their historical counterparts. Historical accuracy doesn't sell films. Good stories, acting, and production values do. But Professor Mark C. Carnes notes that if audiences perceive what they're seeing as inaccurate, they will be less likely to surrender to its vicarious magic. He goes on to say that directors think visually, and that if a movie looks accurate, even if major elements of the plot are not, it will be successful. Wardrobe, setting, even hairstyles all play a part. And so will the way the actors carry their weapons or treat their prisoners. <laughs>